All right, so Acts chapter 15, it's kind of what's going on. Uh, you got Jerusalem and Antioch, all right? Antioch, a city in Syria, so uh, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem, okay? And we're talking about uh, the years 40, 43, 45, 46 AD, so, you know, less or around 15 years after Jesus went to heaven, okay, after Jesus went to earth, and the church is, has become established, right? And you have now the emphasis of the book of Acts is on Paul predominantly, right, in his ministry. Paul seemingly was most consistently based out of the city of Antioch, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, so not in Israel, okay? And there was a uh, dispute, a discussion, a question of whether you had to become Jewish before becoming a Christian. In other words, did you have to be circumcised? And then after putting your faith in Jesus, then did you have to keep the law of Moses, uh, the Ten Commandments and some of the ceremonial laws as well? That was the question. And the Jerusalem Council, uh, specifically the apostles and the elders and the church, came to the conclusion that no, uh, we're saved by faith alone uh, through grace in Jesus Christ, or by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way to be saved. And we're going to talk about some things that they encouraged the church in Antioch uh, because specifically the the naysayers came to the city of Antioch. Just want to mention it is 300 miles north. So you'll see Paul and Barnabas go back and forth. We talked about, we talked about last week or a couple weeks ago. Imagine um, going to the beach, okay? Maybe you've been to the beach before and uh, maybe God called you to go to the beach, and share the gospel. And on your way to the beach, you stopped off in several cities talking about Jesus. When you got to the beach, you did what God had called you to do, share the gospel or uh, help with whatever work was going on there. And then you came back home from the beach and you stopped in the same cities that you had stopped in on the way to the beach to check on the people whom you shared the gospel with right? To, you know, discipleship for the leaders in the church is a continuing thing. It's not, you know, sometimes we just only have the opportunity to share the gospel and we don't have interaction with someone more than that. But uh, sometimes God allows the opportunity for people to continue to fellowship. And so we want to help people grow in their discipleship, right? And so that's what Paul was doing. Well, Paul was in one of these cities away from Jerusalem, predominantly Antioch, 20 miles a day is what the average person could walk. Likely they use donkeys as the most efficient way of travel. So worst case scenario, with no hiccups, a persistent walk, 15 days, one way to get to Antioch. Paul and Barnabas multiple times in a short period of time, walk this. Uh, One they're about to do here, they they get a letter from the people in Jerusalem and they go to Antioch to deliver the letter about the conclusion that they had come to on whether you had to be circumcised before becoming a Christian and whether you had to keep the law after becoming a Christian. So Jerusalem, the elders and apostles have come to a conclusion and now Paul and Barnabas are going back to Antioch delivering this letter. So Verse 22 in Acts chapter 15. Okay. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So just pause right there. There's some treasure right here. Paul and Barnabas were the ones obviously chosen. Remember, they had been chosen in Acts chapter 14, and even previously, Paul and Barnabas uh, had been chosen to be sent out, right? And so they're kind of the leaders in the church in Antioch. And here the church says, uh, let's send a couple more people with Paul and Barnabas, And they chose here this gentleman named Judas and Silas. So chosen, look at that right here. First verse we're reading today. 
people chosen for good works. Maybe there were some people in the church and they didn't get chosen to go back to Antioch to deliver this letter. And maybe they were really wanting to go, like, I want to go, I want to go to Antioch. Sounds like a fun mission trip, you know? Like maybe perhaps we've been a part of some outreach in Nashville uh, with the tornadoes. Um, we've been to Birmingham. We've been to Miami Beach. We've been to Charleston. We've been to the Outer Banks to minister. Uh, I've our youth group has gone to several places to minister. And maybe when that time comes, maybe you, you don't get to go. And you're like, man, I really, really wanted to go. Perhaps God has chosen and called you to do something different. See, that's a cool thing about Jesus amongst the many is that f- from the perspective of the world, if you, if you don't get chosen for the baseball team, well, you just didn't get chosen for the baseball team. But in the body of Christ, if you didn't get chosen for the baseball team, it's because God has something special for you elsewhere. And so you can have hope. You see, the world lacks that hope without a relationship with Jesus Christ. What what do you do? Oh, I just didn't get picked. But in Christ, he says, established in his word, Psalm 139 and throughout, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Here, here's a verse right here. You might know it. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, what we just mentioned. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But verse 10, for we are his workmanship, so we are his poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It doesn't say everybody has a work except for D.A. Brown or your name. Everybody in this room, God knows you, knows how he's gifted you, and he has a special, super unique thing that he's anointed, called, and gifted you to do. And so you don't have to be full of despair when maybe one door closes. Know that there's another door going to be open for you. When, think about this perspective. Say you forced the door open and said, no, 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 I'm going to Antioch, sorry. I want to go, I'm going. I'm going to Antioch. Paul and Barnabas slide over because here I come, right? Think of it from this perspective. If your foot was trying to be a hand, it would be somewhat odd, right? I'm not saying that hasn't happened uh, biologically, but from, for the illustration, that would be abnormal, we would all say, right? The same thing in the body of Christ. If someone is called and anointed and chosen to do a specific role, and they reject that role, and instead walk in a different role that they want to do, just of their own accord, that God has not called them to do, it would be abnormal, it would be awkward. We would all recognize it, right? And so uh, it would be unwise for anybody in this room, me included, uh, those in the body of Christ, to say, no, I'm gonna do this no matter what if that's not what Christ has called and anointed you to do. Here's another il- illustration. Do you have a TV at home? Okay, some of you, many of you may have a TV at home. Monday morning, tomorrow morning, it's time to go to work. You pick your TV up, you carry your TV outside to the driveway, you set your TV on the ground, and you sit on your TV to drive to work. Your neighbor drives by, they call the church and said, hey, uh, Bobby, he's out there sitting on his TV trying to drive to work, okay? We, silly illust- illustration, but that could happen in our lives when God has given us a gift to use a specific way that he's called and anointed us to do. And we just do whatever we want instead. Now, God is sovereign and uh, he will work out those mistakes in our life as we look to him. But the life lesson, God has a special place, role, and work for you to accomplish on earth for him. It's unique to you and where your fulfillment will be found. Read it one more time. God has a special place, role, and work for you to accomplish on earth for him. It's unique 
to you and where your fulfillment will be found. All right? Think about this. Back to the TV illustration that seems silly. Imagine being the TV. TV's supposed to, you know, show the game or show some uh, teaching or some worship music at your house, you know, watch some cool videos like that. And instead, your TV's outside laying in the driveway uh, with someone sitting on it, okay? Do you think that TV is finding the fulfillment that it was created for? No. Silly example. Silly example, but think about this. How many in this room, how many listening this morning are living an unfulfilled life simply because you're trying to do what you want to do instead of what Christ has called you to do? Look, it's the plug for the outlet family, whoever's listening this morning. If you want to live a fulfilled, satisfied life, first and foremost, give your life to your creator, Jesus Christ, and receive the forgiveness of your sins. And second, follow what his plan is for your life. And you could say, well, I don't know what his plan is for my life. Keep serving him. Keep taking steps of faith to to the step one that he's given you. Or the A or the B or the C, one at a time progressively until he reveals more of it. But just say yes to the, maybe the first thing Jesus Christ is calling you to as a part of this ministry or whatever fellowship you're plugged into is to help clean because that's a need. And you're like, wow, that, is that significant in the body of Christ? If that's what Christ is doing, if Christ is calling you to sparkle, that is the most significant thing you could do. So don't consider, let's not consider something that Christ has called us to do, like maybe picking up trash as insignificant. All right. So, verse 23. Then they wrote this letter by them. All right, so here's the letter. You ready? So they're sending the letter. What did the letter contain? Well, here's the letter. They wrote this letter by them. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren. To the brethren who were of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. Since we've heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, not the same Judas from Jesus. We therefore, verse 27, we therefore sent Judas and Silas who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That you abstain, okay, here it is. He says, here's, here's the core of it. They said you had to be circumcised and keep the law. We didn't come to that conclusion in church leadership in, in Jerusalem. Here's the conclusion we came to, verse 29, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. To the point, right? Short and sweet. So the letter said three things. And he had three points at the end of it, but, but notice what the, the emphasis of the letter was. We heard what was told you. Hey, church at Antioch, we heard about what someone came to your church and said, okay? Number two, it's not true. What they went and told you, that's not true. That doesn't line up with God's word. And then number three, Here's what is true. Here is the truth. It's important that we stick to what God has said. There's a safety, and that can eliminate confusion in every one of our lives. Sometimes we get to the position, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, Even yesterday, uh, the Lord, 
I thought, laid something seemingly small on my heart to do. I just happened to ask about a situation, say, hey, Lord, what would you like me to do? And I thought I came to a conclusion. Just as a litmus test, I just said, hey, Lord, you know, not necessarily a fleece, but through the testimony of two or three witnesses in your word, can you please confirm that which I believe you've spoken to me this morning? Okay? So I, I want to, you know, I didn't want to step out uh, unwisely. So I grabbed a devotional that I had laying around that I don't always read. Just open it up. Boom. Verse confirmation right there. So I took a step of faith and did what uh, God had called me to do. And so uh, here we see this, that they are applying the word, not adding to or taking away from it. There's some other things I like to note here. Pastor Kevin elaborate, elaborated on much of that last week. You can listen to find out more about this situation. But here's some more information on what someone had said to the church at Antioch. Okay, Titus chapter 1 verse 10. Ready? For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. Isn't that bold? Who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. These people who were speaking things incorrectly were to be strongly corrected by the leadership of the church, specifically the elders. And so we read about in Titus where that happened, where the elders were made aware of it, and they said, no. That doesn't line up with God's word, and we're going to speak to it. Here's a passage. So, so we see there was an issue, right? There was an issue about where deceivers were coming in and lying about how to follow Jesus, okay? There was an issue. The apostles and the elders met. They came to a unanimous conclusion, okay? And so let's just take a split second to look, of, look at the responsibility that a leader has in the church and helping to lead you spiritually. Let's just take a glance at the, the, the weight that God has placed on the responsibility of elders. Titus 1, 6 through 9, listen to this. It says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as, as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. There should be a maturity in the elder's life to not only walk out the Christian faith, but also to convince and convict those who are speaking contrary against the truth. And, it's a, and sometimes in some situations, uh, it, it calls for boldness, where the leader in a fellowship, specifically the elders, uh, m maybe even outside of here, somewhere else, is a responsibility that God has called us to speak into situations that are contrary to the word of God. It's important. Very important. So I thought it's relevant uh, that we just remind you, maybe you haven't been coming uh, for too long, who the elders here at the bridge are. And so we have a list for you. Um, Pastor David, actually, it's kind of cool. Here's the years that they began. To, so the fellowship started not long after 
Um, Pastor David has shared that testimony before. Um, but then you have Pastor Kevin and Tom and Nick and Joel and myself and Mike. Uh, let me start over. Pastor David, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Tom, Pastor Nick, Joel, myself, Brother Mike, Pastor Jim, Steve, Jim Rouse, Pastor Carson, and Sean Wilson. You have a, uh, if you've had any interaction with these men, uh, you know that they are men of integrity, uh, men who walk in boldness, men who uh, know the word and love the word and are willing to share the word with, uh, and the gospel with anybody at any moment as God opens the door. Um, are there any elders in here right now by any chance? If there is, there's Brother Steve's at the back door. Is there any uh, another elder? There's, there, yeah, there's another uh, elder, Pastor Tom, right there. Um, any other elders? Cool. So there's, we have two elders. We have elders multitasking this morning, helping to, to have church this morning. Um, so Hebrews 13, 17 says this, and I, it just is what it is, okay? Uh, I just led to share this, but listen to the second part of it. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they, listen to this, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account, as those who must give account for you. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. It is a, you know, as I grow in my relationship with Christ and as I look to the maturity of other elders uh, who uh, I serve with and have gleaned from for, for years, um, I've learned that uh, how significant the responsibility is in our accountability to God to help you along in your faith. Like he could have put he could put any elder in this fellowship, but this is these are the elders that he's um, put in place, and so it's important that we be praying for one another, pray for leadership. You know, um, I've mentioned before about the spiritual battle it is to share the word of God with you. Um, you know, I could, I could go into details, but I save you the details. But it's just, there's just something that happens as elders try and serve you. And, and things just supernaturally, nothing weird, but there's a spiritual battle that happens. I'm saying it plainly. There's a spiritual battle that happens when we try and wash your feet so that you can walk in all God has called you to walk in. So I would encourage you to consistently be praying for the elders um, so that, you know, we can continue to walk out what God has called us to do. So no better time than to, uh, to lift the elders up than right now. So if you would, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray for them. Lord, uh, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for the elders that you've anointed uh, to serve here, uh, this fellowship, this Assembly of Saints. Uh, thank you for their love for you. Thank you for calling them, God. Thank you for anointing them. Uh, thank you for protecting them and their families, Jesus. Uh, Lord, we ask you to continue to protect them, continue to give them wisdom and discernment uh, so that they can continue and, uh, to lead us into what you've called us to do while we're here on earth. Lord, we just mentioned a minute ago those special tasks and those special uh, responsibilities that you've given every person listening. No one is left out. When they put their faith in you, you have something special for them to do. Well, anoint the elders, Lord, to see that and to help facilitate what you're wanting to do in everyone's life. Lord, we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the leaders, and uh, we thank you for the unity that we have found in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. So I would encourage you to continue to pray for the elders and the leaders and Pray for one another. Maybe this week uh, you're sitting on a row or see someone in the hallway and God brings that face and name up uh, to you this week. Pray for that person. It could be while you're driving down the road. You, you don't know why God is laying someone on your heart to pray for in that moment. I remember, um, this is cool. I remember being young 
and uh, being in uh, Bible studies, but around other mature believers, often godly women, honestly, would talk about the testimonies that they had seen God uh, bring about in their life when they had been called to pray for someone spontaneously, what they thought was spontaneously. And, you know, they, man, I remember some stories vividly where uh, uh, a prayer warrior was called to pray. And so they started praying and turns out somebody was in a car accident at the very moment and serious car wreck and everybody was okay, you know? And so that's a dramatic story and we're not gonna over elaborate on how all that works. But the point is when God lays on your heart and your mind, somebody or something to pray for, there's never a better time than to pray for that thing than right then, than right then. So why did people say to the church in Antioch that you must be circumcised to be saved? Why would someone say that? It's interesting. At a first glance, you're like, why? Okay, it's, why would they say that it's, it's more than just putting your trust in Jesus? That you had to do something before you put your faith in Jesus, and then after you put your faith in Jesus to be saved, you had to do something else. Why would they say that? I don't know. Well, Timothy tells us a little bit. Check it out. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1-9 through 9 says... And I'm putting a lot of verses up here today to give us some context. But let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Ready? See, so, so Paul is writing to young Timothy, who's a pastor, okay? Potentially... Uh, just a little side nugget. Timothy was the pastor of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Potentially. At minimum, Ephesus. Timothy being the pastor at the church in Ephesus in Turkey that's written about in the book of Revelation. Maybe that helps put some pieces together for you. But continuing on, he, he, Paul says to Timothy, young, young pastor Timothy, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing. So he's telling you, he's like, look, some, God, some people are, are saying it's more than what Jesus has said. Loving God and loving people. Okay? And some of them are telling you that because they believe that achieving this godliness can be a great personal gain perhaps materially or financially. And Paul is correcting this and he, he, he sums it up with this, in this portion specifically, verse six. Now godliness, listen, godliness, that means walking in holiness, walking in a, you know, an honoring relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, walking honorably with Jesus Christ is something we all aspire to do. Paul says, walking in godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction. Summary, it means and can mean that personal gain aspiring and achieving personal gain can bring about constant friction with the relationships that are around you. Just, that's what Paul is saying there. So, specifically summarizing the letter one more time, I think you'll, and we're gonna move on to some milk, meat, you know, gospel, all that in this morning's teaching, but it's all in there. So let's, you know, go ahead and cover everything the word of God says this morning, Right. So they said this in the bottom of the letter, right? Uh, starting in verse 29, I have it summarized here for you. And there's a reason why they say this, and you'll find it maybe interesting, I did too, okay? 
There's a little, there's always like another layer. It's a cool rap song. Anyways, I'm going to skip that. Anyways, uh, so one, abstain from things offered to idols. Abstain from things. Okay, that's, if you want to, hey, note takers. I'm not putting this up, I don't think. Note takers. 1 Corinthians 8.13. Okay, look into that. Another, abstain from blood and things strangled. Leviticus 3.17. And then sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. You ready for this? I think you'll like this. In other words, don't stumble the Gentiles from coming to God because the Gentiles were big on marking meat and offering it to an idol and then selling it later in the marketplace. That's what Paul was reminding us later on in the scriptures that, hey, if, it, it, don't ask where it comes from because if you eat it and it's been offered to an idol, it could cause the other people around you to stumble because you're eating this, okay? And so Paul's like saying, look, don't add a bunch, don't overcomplicate our faith. The main thing is to not stumble people who are trying to come to Jesus, if it's better for you to, uh, from, to abstain from something in a moment because it's going to uh, cause your classmate, your family member, your friend who you've been serving and ministering to and sharing the gospel with, if that's going to cause them confusion and perhaps a roadblock and them coming to Jesus, Paul is saying, abstain from it. Don't do whatever that thing is. Even though you have the freedom and liberty to do it, you have the freedom and liberty but it might be wiser for the sake of the gospel just to abstain. So he's saying don't stumble the Gentiles and come to God. And then don't stumble the Jews because things strangled in the blood. Remember, God is very clear about that in the scriptures. To uh, The life is in the blood and the Jews did not want to uh, partake of the blood. It was a law in Leviticus chapter 3. And so Paul's like, look, don't don't." Uh, Cause them to stumble by eating things that have blood in them or things that are strangled. And then he says this, stay away from dishonoring God because that will wreck all of it. When he says flee sexual immorality. He's saying, look, you talk about really messing your witness up. And we know that's true. So thank you for plowing through some of that with me. Uh, I think that you could mine it some more if you desire and there's, uh, even more treasure in there. So life lesson. It's true. Following Jesus boils down to loving him, and that should be a capital H there, and loving others. It's true. Following Jesus boils down to loving him and loving others. And that was the emphasis of what Paul was saying here by uh, don't eat things that have been offered to idols is because it causes this large people group to stumble. That's what the Jerusalem council was saying. And and don't eat things that are full of blood and have been strangled because that that stumbles the Jews whom we're also trying to reach. And then he's like, and look, man, stay free from sexual immorality because that could wreck the whole thing, wreck your life. So it's true. It's true. Following Jesus boils down to loving him and loving others. I heard a pastor say many many times, he said, uh, the older he gets, the more simply profound it becomes. Following Jesus is loving him and loving others. All right. Verse 30. Good stuff. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. So the people get this letter and like, whoa, we don't have to be circumcised and we don't have to keep the law. We can't keep the law. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're not under that yoke. We can simply put our trust in Jesus. Uh, uh, Through faith, we're saved by grace. By grace, we're saved through faith. By grace, we're saved through faith. And they, they heard that great, great news. People rejoiced over the encouragement. Check this out. Listen to this, family. Maybe you're downtrodden. Maybe you're downcast. Maybe you're a little sullen. Maybe your head's down. The truths of the Bible should cause you to rejoice. Let me just remind you. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've asked him to forgive you of your sins. You're forgiven of everything wrong you've ever done. Don't even think about it. You're forgiven. 
Praise the Lord, right? That's something, I mean, praise the Lord, right? Okay, so we're forgiven. I mean, that's not a small thing, family. And, and, and when you weigh it out, how big is our bank account or whether we're forgiven of our sins or not, I would go with the whether we're forgiven or not being the more important thing because one gets you into eternity with Jesus forever. And your bank account just sits here and rots. Here's another thing. We're gonna live, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, in the kingdom forever. I don't know what your day, what your battle holds right now. But let's just pause for 0.5 seconds and think, whoa, forever. So I have a question. Do you live a life filled with joy? Adding expectations and responsibilities that God has not placed on you will remove your joy. Here's a book of joy. Adding to it things that God has not put on you will will cause you to become disillusioned, discouraged, and uncontent, discontent. It will. Listen, just listen to this. Psalm 1611. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. Look, Psalm 30, verse five. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If you find yourself or you found yourself or if you right now are downcast, discouraged, I'm going through a tough moment, I would encourage you to step into the presence of Jesus Christ because according to the word, in his presence is fullness of joy. It's like a key that everybody in the world will pay $10 billion for. And it's right here for free. Paid for already by the blood of the king. It's up to you whether you take the key or not. First Chronicles 16, 26 to 27. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Strength and gladness are in his place. Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. No doubt there's some prophetic implications about the Messiah in these passages in Isaiah. But no doubt when we're clothed with the forgiveness and righteousness of Jesus Christ, it causes great joy in our life. Just two more. Psalm 71, 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you. In my soul, which you have redeemed. Look, perhaps this is conditional. Perhaps this verse is conditional. Psalm 71, 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you. Maybe you got caught in the mud this week. Maybe you got your foot stuck in the mud this week. Maybe you found yourself in a situation that you perhaps didn't walk in victory to the way that you've been called to by Jesus Christ, okay? Ask for forgiveness, receive your forgiveness, and rejoice in your Savior. And that joy will come. The only thing that's preventing you from the joy is the idols that we're trying to put in our life to replace God with. I get it. I have days. Oh, do I have days. And then somehow, some way, if you can get back directed to her, he's sovereign, he's omnipotent, he's full of love, grace, and mercy toward us, it's all good. It's all good. Here's one more. New Testament. John 15, 9 through 12. As a father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. Okay, he's saying, look, keep these commandments. Abide in Jesus, keep these commandments. Listen, that 
that my joy may remain in you and that your joy, who wants full joy? I want full joy. That your joy may be full. Verse 12, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I've loved you. Love. Love. I, I work in, a, uh, I work in a, a regular environment like many of you do here, okay, you know, during the week. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a group of people, consistently often the same group of people, and we all have our strengths and weaknesses and challenges. The, one of the, at the end of my work week, as, of, as I continue to grow in my faith, Jesus, trust in Jesus, trying to live out, you know, God, what do you call me to do? What's my spot, Lord? What's my gifting? What's my role here on earth? At the, when I look back on my work weeks, what brings the greatest delight? Even with people who haven't fully put their trust in Jesus yet, is loving one another. At the end of my work week, if I, if I condemn, look down upon, speak rudely against my coworkers, at the end of my work week, I f- I'm full of a little bit of regret, honestly, and have to repent. If at the end of my work week, I've noticed and recognized times where the Holy Spirit has f- uh, flown, excuse me, poured out through me to love the people around me, I look at my work week with gratification. That's a successful work week or not to me in many ways. Yes, production and trying to accomplish the company goals and honor those in leadership. And I do find delight in applying God's word in those ways. But I'm just telling you, as I'm growing older and as uh, I continue to follow Jesus, a successful work week, yes, doing what God has called me to do and all those things, but God has called me primary, primarily to love those in my life. Even those people who, you know, hey, listen, I could sit around and point, well, this person has this uh, tendency that uh, rubs me wrong or gets on my nerves, and this person has this tendency, and it just really gets on my nerves, you know? But you know what? They could also this morning look at my life and say, well, he just does that, and it really gets on my nerves. They could say the same thing about, I'm I'm not perfect. I'm, uh, you know, justified, uh, being sanctified one day, be be glorified. But I say that to say, man, that's a successful work week where I can look back and say, I know God's at work. I know God's at work in my environments. So if we lack joy, the life lesson, if we lack joy, if we lack joy, if we lack joy, we likely aren't keeping the simple commandments of loving God and loving others. I'm not talking about having a bad day or things. I'm mean, just keep, them, keep it what I say here and what the word says specifically, not you know, what I'm saying, but more importantly, what, we re- what we're reading this morning. If we lack joy, we likely aren't keeping the simple commandments of loving God and loving others. Or let's, let's word this differently. What are, what are ways we're not loving God? Loving idols. If our affection is for something that's a false God more than the king, we're going to be discontent, rattled, and lack joy. It's true. You know how many times uh, in my family and just being, uh, just elaborating, uh, the contention has come in my home, not because anything, anybody's shortcomings, but because that an idol in my heart that I'm trying to worship, which is causing the contention in the home. Transparent enough? It's not, not some shrine I'm bowing down to necessarily, but I'm just being honest. Because listen, if, if, if I'm loving God in my home, it, you know, and, and there, I'm not putting anything before him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. If I'm doing that, and variables come up, you can't disrupt that in our hearts. Think about that. You can't disrupt the love of God that someone has for him. But if you have an idol, it's easy to disrupt that because it's of the world and something can step in between you and that idol. And so what's the natural result? Irritation, right? Angst, 
get out of my way. You're, you're stopping me from serving my idol, right? I'm just, <laughs> but if, you're, if your love primarily, numero uno, is God, n- someone's inconsistencies or someone's having a bad day, really honestly, family, won't get in the way of breaking that communion that you're having with the Father. Actually, on the flip side, that which from the world's perspective is an irritation in the kingdom of God becomes an opportunity. Can you write that down? My wife says, star it too. Put a big star beside it. It's not chaos. No, but I just, I, I just find that. It's natural observations. Uh, not natural observations, supernatural observations. Okay, anyways, verse 32. We're, we're almost, we're getting there. Yeah. Verse 32. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. So they went to Antioch, stayed there for a little while, and then they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles in Jerusalem. Verse 34. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Okay? I want to go back to the responsibilities of an elder for just a minute. In that verse, it said in Hebrew, you know, look, I can, I can read this verse. We both can read this verse this morning that I read earlier. And it's up to you, your response to it. Because you could, you could emphasize one part of it, and I could be where I'm at, what Christ is doing in my heart to the Holy Spirit, emphasizing or God could be working out in me another part of the verse. And so perhaps you could tune me out because you don't like part of the verse and miss that that's not even the point that I'm trying to emphasize to you this morning. Fair? So that Hebrews 13, 17 verse, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. That's not what I'm emphasizing. Yes, it's there and yes, it's God's word. But that's not what I'm, for they, this is the part I'm emphasizing. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. It is a real thing that the responsibility to help you and to help one another be victorious in Christ and what God has called you to do. Like, I want you to win. Like, because I, I'm, 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 I feel like, I, I believe, I know that I'm on the path of victory, watching what Christ is doing in my life. And I know that I'm walking in many of the things that he's called me to walk in. And so this joy is real, this fulfillment is tangible. And because he's placed a supernatural love in me and in many leaders in the church for you, because we we now have this supernatural love that God has placed in us for you. We love you. We want you to walk in the victory and the fulfillment and the joy and the power and the peace of God. That, that's, that brings great delight. Like when a disciple is flourishing, excuse me, when a disciple is flourishing, it brings great delight. And that's what they're doing in the book of Acts, these leaders. And so I, I desire as a man of God to replicate that which was started in the early church. Here's a couple of verses. And we've read this one before, Acts 14, 21 through 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. Listen to this. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying we must do many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We already talked about the tribulation part. I want to emphasize this. I want you to be strengthened. From, from, from the youngest person in this room to those who are, uh, have been on earth the longest in this room. I want everybody, I want, I want myself, I, this is what Christ wants for us. He wants us to be strengthened. 
Acts 18, 22 through 23. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. This is Paul. He went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, look, strengthening all the disciples. Okay, so that's a responsibility that God has appointed some in the church to make sure that we are all being strengthened and the disciples are being strengthened, and exhorted and encouraged. There's another part. Do you want to be stronger? Do you want to be strengthened? Do you want your family to be stronger? Do you want to be stronger? Do you want to be strengthened? And do you want your family to be stronger? Well, then apply the word that God is speaking to us. Allow him to bring it forth. So, you know, I... I Listen to teachings here for years. And initially, many things often are repeated because God's word often is consistent. It always is consistent. And so many of the principles in God's words come up and then comes up again and it's recommunicated again. Listen, please, listen. Everybody, young people, people who are called by God, listen, please, everybody. And you hear a principle initially and maybe you feel like, oh, that's a little heavy or that's not where I'm at right now. I would like to, to understand that. I would like to grasp that. I would like to have that. Ask God for that. Keep coming and delighting in his word. And when, it's, when it comes up again, it'll, the dots will start to connect even more. And you'll be like, I see this unfolding. I see this unfolding in my life. I see God bringing about this prayer request to fruition of being strong and mature and walking in my gifts. Think about this. Liars came to the church of Antioch and said, you have to become Jewish before being a Christian and you have to keep the law after you become a Christian. The elders came to tell the truth and strengthen the disciples in faith. If you, me, we, if we are not applying what God's word is sharing with us, we can't expect to be strong. When I ask the question, do you want to be strong as a Christian? Do you want to be strengthened? And do you want your family to be fortified? Okay, that doesn't mean that there won't be battles, but here, you know what? I believe, and this is just the way I believe, and because the word says that I believe it and that's it. But when the word of God tells me that when I train up a child and the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it, I believe it. There, <laughs> there are sometimes battles between point A and point B, but I'm already thanking God for the B because I know it's coming. So, all right, let me say this another way about strength in, the, in your faith. We don't have much teaching left, but there's still more treasure. Said another way, if our actions more closely align what the world is saying than what the word is saying, you can't expect to be spiritually strengthened and strong. If our actions, if our lives more closely align with the world is saying instead of what the word is saying we can't expect to be strengthened and strong in our faith we can't expect it because the world is a liar the prince of this world is a liar he's come his whole goal is to kill us to to steal from us and to destroy us and so we can't expect like look look He's a deceiver. The, the devil is a deceiver. He's a liar. And he's deceptive. He comes, he comes like using other mediums to communicate with us, like thinking that things are good and they're not. Anyways, life lesson. If you want to be strengthened spiritually, receive the exhortation from God's word that the elders are pouring into your life. If you want to be strengthened spiritually, 
receive the exhortation from God's word that the elders are pouring into your life. For years, I've seen many lives here let the word of God be worked out in them, and over time, they become powerhouse warriors for the kingdom of God. All right, here we go, last portion, verse 36. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Don't miss verse 36, though, just because I called the worship team out. (laughs) You don't want to miss the ending. All right. Verse 36. Then after some days... Paul said to Barnabas, let us, now go back, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord. And let's see how they're doing. Super cool, huh? Going back again, checking on the brothers and sisters. See how everybody's doing. Verse 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. How often, like Barnabas was like called like often to help Paul in ministry, right? Through some uh, pretty significant situation in Paul's ministry. These are like a, they were like the, I don't know what earthly example to use here, these, this dynamic duo, right? The dynamic duo of Paul and Barnabas. But now here, they have this contention. And, and one of them's like, uh, Barnabas wants to bring John Mark with him. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. I, we're not, he left us last time. We're not picking him up. And he's not coming back again on this journey. What's interesting is, Well, there's a, couple, there's a few things interesting. Number one, Barnabas isn't specifically in history mentioned again, right? He's, he's alluded to other times in other letters, but sequentially, he's not, that I found personally. So I caveat it with that. But also say this, later, Paul is in jail in Rome right before his death. And guess who he calls for? Yeah, Mark, 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 11. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans in, uh, for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you, for he is useful for me. He is useful to me for ministry. Get Mark. Oh, there's another place too. Listen to this, Colossians 4.10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. Two other times he mentions Mark and it's in very favorable light. Restoration can happen. We can dive down into some of the particulars of this ministry moment where uh, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement and Paul didn't have a favorable opinion about Mark. Didn't. And so uh, you look at the result of it and Paul goes and does missionary work and so does Barnabas. And now you have two missionary teams, okay? You have multiplication in the midst of this Unfortunate situation that did not escape God's sovereignty and omnipotence. So restoration can happen, but it's important that minds be changed for healing to come in relationships. Like, let me say it differently. The goal should be that you want relationships to be restored. Because if the body of Christ, if we're called to walk in unity, and listen, we're gonna rub shoulders for a long time, right? Until we go be with Jesus face to face. And there's gonna be stuff every once in a while. 
It just happens, okay? It's life on earth without perfection yet, okay? But we do know the commandment is to walk in love and to walk in unity. And so may it be the heart's goal and the mind's goal of everyone in here to walk in restoration with those potentially that you've had some past contention or conflict with. Let God, let God heal it. I'm going to close with this. Mm. Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to read something very intense as we close, okay? If you'd like to turn there, you can. You don't have to. If you don't want to, I'll read it to you. Revelation, and whatever your, your perspective is on this, just please uh, allow me to... Uh, to read this to you. There's two, there's two dynamics to what I'm about to read, okay? There's two dynamics, and we're gonna sing and give God thanks, and we're gonna break some bread in a few minutes. We'd love to have you stay, but may I have you tuned in to this intense passage, Revelation chapter 16. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And please keep listening with me. I'm not going down rabbit trails right now. You can dive into some studies on this later, but there's two things I wanna to emphasize to you, okay? Verse three, then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and is to be, because you've judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Just let me emphasize something. Please don't convolute this moment of judgment that's coming. God definitely is gonna judge the earth and it's definitely gonna be uh, provocative, striking, fierce in many ways. But, but, But the people he's pouring judgment on have have intentionally, thoughtfully, with reason, killed God's people. They have, an intent, they have intentionally murdered people because they follow God. Verse eight. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. God was bringing, God will, God is bringing forth judgment. And there's still, there's this moment people are not repenting. They're saying, no, no, God, we reject you. Verse 10, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Instead of asking their creator for forgiveness in the moment, they blasphemed him. 12, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great uh, river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And Jesus says this, verse 15, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Here's the two things I want you to take away. God wants to strengthen you this morning. There is wrath coming upon the earth. It's plain and it's clear. 
And it's coming directly toward those who are in opposition to God. Those who don't want God in their life. Those who blaspheme God. They're, they're antagonists against, they're fighting against God. There is judgment coming. And you can escape that judgment by putting your faith in Jesus and being forgiven of your sin and the relationship between you and God can be restored. Like you, you, your relationship with God, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad it is, don't even think about it maybe, ask for forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ, the penalty has already been paid for so you don't have to have the judgment. You don't have to have the judgment if you put your faith in Jesus. If you'll simply put your trust in him, you can be forgiven. And here's the second part. This is coming, it's true. And more important than the disagreement we have with someone else is the mission to go save souls as the body of Christ. More important is the mission that we've been called to as believers to win souls than any division or dissension you have with anybody in the body of Christ. And so this morning, two restorations could happen. The restoration of your relationship with God of the universe through that cross over there and what Jesus did for you. You can be forgiven and re uh, relieved of your shame, of your guilt, of your condemnation this morning. You can never, you might have carried it in, but you can walk out a free man with a wonderful future promised in an established relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can also forgive whoever in your heart perhaps you've been in conflict with, whoever it may be, and allow God to restore that relationship so we can be single-minded and walk in unity and what God has called us to do, to see many come into the kingdom because when we get to heaven, that's gonna be the most important thing. So this morning, the meal spiritually has been served. And I pray that the Lord would encourage you and what you're supposed to do with it. Lord, I thank you for this morning and I thank you for this word, Lord, uh, where you spoke truth into a situation and there was rejoicing from it. Burdens were lifted. And so this morning we're reminded that in you is the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. For by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Lord, now after that, you have a responsibility, a calling, a place for us in ministry to go reach other people so they can live with you forever. So this morning, if there's anyone in here as he sings who wants a relationship with Jesus Christ, you perhaps could come up here to the altar and spend some time with the Lord. Or if you need to talk to the Lord about a relationship in your life and see what the Lord would have you to do to restore, have that relationship restored, I would encourage you to do business with God. But whatever it is, will you take a minute as we sing and see what the Lord would have you to do this morning in Jesus' name. Worthy of every breath we 
could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will build my life upon Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And so, Lord, we pray for um, unity amongst the body of Christ, your bride, so that we can run with zeal the race that you've set before us until you call us home. May we be primarily focused on loving you and loving others. And Lord, if there's anyone in here who wants a relationship with you, wants to be forgiven, Maybe you've been carrying this baggage around. Lord, you could be what they've been looking for. If that's you this morning, if you would like to have a relationship with Jesus, be forgiven. Many of the mention, the things I mentioned this morning, the good news, you can simply talk to God right now. Perhaps just like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven. I've done wrong things and I'm sorry. Please forgive me of all those things. Thank you for forgiving me. I give my life to you. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you every day and what you have for me to do. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the people. I just thank you for your word. It's so good. You're so good to us, Father. So gracious. And Lord, I thank you that we're not just here floundering around on earth, Lord, with no purpose or our own goals just made up on a whim. But Lord, you've given us clear, clear direction on what's gonna bring joy. So may we, may we heed and abide in you. As I close you out, blessing you, Pastor Jim's gonna come out in just a moment and or over there. And so after I say amen, he's just gonna mention the practicalities about the agape feast. We'd love to have you break some bread. Acts 2.42 with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May his countenance overshadow and surround you. 
And may you know his peace, his shalom, his wholeness, his healing, his prosperity. In the name of Jesus, we all said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, family. Thank you.